because I have a dream. That my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Hey, everybody. I'm Marianne Williamson. Welcome to my podcast. On January 18th, we will be celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And uh, this is the time when we all think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We talk about him, and hopefully we learn ever more to embody the principles for which he lived and died. I'd like to tell you my own personal a story related to Martin Luther King Jr. All of us have uh, our own interface with his being and with his ideas. And mine started when I was 15 years old uh, and the day that he was assassinated. I was doing what was usually happening in the afternoon. Um, there wasn't 24-hour news at that time. I was in the den watching television. Uh, I grew up in Houston, and my mother was in the kitchen making dinner. This was a very normal routine in my household. And in those days, breaking news meant something. It drives me insane the way now practically every newscast is, is preceded by breaking news, keeping everybody in this heightened state of alert. Uh, when the breaking news might be that Justin Bieber got a DWI or something. it's I think it's a terrible um, dereliction of duty on the part of the, the news media that they, for the sake of a, of a hit, you know, in their ratings, will keep everybody on the verge of their seats by saying it's breaking news, even when it shouldn't be treated as something that important. And I say that because when I was growing up, if you saw breaking news, that meant everybody came to watch to see. It said breaking news. And they came on and they said that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot and killed that day at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. My mother turned around. She was watching. I remember she had a towel in her hand, a dish towel, and she looked just stricken. And very shortly after, my father, as this was the time when he would come home from work, come to the utility room, we called it, into the breakfast room. My mother's just standing there stricken. And I run up to my father and I say, Daddy, Daddy, Martin Luther King Jr. got killed. Dr. Martin Luther King, somebody shot and killed Dr. Martin Luther King. And I saw my father look out into the distance. And he said, those bastards. And I was like, what does he mean, those bastards? Does he know who killed him? And of course, I would grow to understand that it was those bastards who killed him. Regardless who killed him, it was those bastards. I remember that day almost as though it was yesterday. I had the same experience that everybody living and old enough in America had. It was, of course, we had a, <laughs> we had a lot that went on that year. Later, Bobby Kennedy would be killed as well the years of tumult. And then decades later, I'm writing a book called Healing the Soul of America. I knew that I wanted to talk about, I had written two books that were about spiritual things based on the Course in Miracles. I had written A Return to Love, and then I had written a book uh, called A Woman's Worth. And a lot of people were, were surprised that she wants to write a book now about politics. But I didn't just want to write a book about politics. I wanted to apply the same spiritual principles somehow to what I knew was going on collectively. I could see that the same psychological and emotional and spiritual principles that prevail within the life of an individual obviously prevail within the life of a society. So two things went on for me in preparing to write that book. One was a deeper study of American history than I had ever had before, which is why my understanding of racial history in the United States became deepened and more convicted, why I talk about racial injustice and mass incarceration and reparations. This was back in 1998, but everything that we're looking at in a stage four cancer now was already a stage one cancer then. But more than that, when I went to look, well, where do you bring the spiritual things in? I read deeper than I had ever read about Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. 
Now, first with studying Gandhi, I realized that the the philosophy of nonviolence was the interface of spirituality and politics that I was looking for. This was nothing new. This had already been done. And I remind you in having this conversation that not only were Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. themselves conduits of nonviolent philosophy, but they were also the heads of the two most successful political movements of the 20th century. That that Gandhi nonviolently was able to get the British out of the colonial British empire out of India and the movement of civil rights in the United States. So this is what Gandhi said. Gandhi said that there is within each of us an inner light. And he had been influenced by the American Quakers He said he was influenced. He talked about Thoreau. He had read Thoreau. He was influenced by Thoreau. The transcendentalists in the United States were a great influence, Gandhi said, on his thinking. He said that there's an inner light within every man, woman, and child. And that that inner light, he said, can heal not only personal relationships, but political and social relationships as well. Wow. Martin Luther King Jr. travels to India. He studies the philosophy of nonviolence, and he brings it back to the United States for application to the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said about Gandhi that he was the first person in human history to take the love ethic of Jesus Christ. Now, remember, to Gandhi, who was not a Christian, this was not just the love ethic of Jesus Christ. It's the love ethic at the heart of all great religious and spiritual teacher. But Martin Luther King's line was that he was the first person to take the love ethic of Jesus Christ beyond mere social interaction to become a broad-scale social force for good. So Gandhi and King, no lightweights in the politics department, both of whom headed the most powerful political movements of the 20th century saw love not as some namby-pamby, weak, woo-woo thing, but as the instrumentation for societal and political repair. And the only one that they said, which would lead to ultimate reconciliation and not just repetition of the problems in new forms. I had a few hours with Yolanda that were actually just a lot of fun once. And I have met several times our fantastic guest today, the youngest daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King, Reverend Bernice King. Uh, I also want to tell you another uh, little anecdote before I introduce you to Bernice. After 9-11, a few months after, I was invited by Mrs. King to be the speaker at Ebenezer Baptist Church, the pulpit, Dr. Martin Luther King's pulpit. I was invited to be the speaker that year at the celebration for uh, Dr. King's birthday. And I was very, very excited about it. And you can just imagine how I prepared for that talk. And remember, uh, 9-11, that was in September. And then the the talk at Ebenezer was in, in January. I suppose it was in January. Now, I definitely had things I wanted to say about nonviolence. And I wanted to make sure that President George W. Bush heard me. (laughs) So I go there that day and I'm so excited. And I don't think at that time I had met Coretta Scott King yet. I don't think, but I'm so excited and I'm a little bit nervous. And I was put in this like holding room, right? And I, I thought I was just waiting to meet Mrs. King before I went on. A gentleman comes in a few minutes later, and he says to me, are you ready, Miss Williamson? Mrs. King and Mrs. Bush will see you now. And I'm like, what do you mean, <laughs> Mrs. King and Mrs. Bush? And, and my brain is just like, uh, uh, oh, my God. I had no idea that Barbara Bush was going to be there. Laura Bush, Laura Bush. This is the George W. Laura Bush. And I'm so nervous, and I'm, and I'm saying to myself, okay, Miss Nonviolence. Okay, Miss Feminist, how are you going to do what you're doing? Say what you want to say. But remember, the woman on that stage, are going to be these two women sitting behind you on the pulpit while you're talking. And one of them sleeps with him every night. So remember all this nonviolent stuff? Remember all this feminist stuff? How are you going to do that? Well, I have about five minutes to figure it out. So I'm praying 
I'm praying. I'm praying because I know where I am. I'm at Ebenezer Baptist Church. I'm in Atlanta. I'm in an audience that you get down and you get real girl or get off the stage. And Laura Bush is sitting behind me. So I pray. I do my best. And I remember that the main thing that happened for me was that I said the same things I had planned to say, but every time I would mention George Bush, I would turn around and I would say, and Mrs. Bush, we're certainly praying for your husband at this time. We know this is a difficult time and we're praying for your husband. But then I felt I had to be true to my heart with the things that I said and what I felt about American military policy and nonviolence, et cetera, in response to 9-11. When I finished my talk, I turned around, I shook Mrs. Mrs. Uh, King's hand. She was lovely. I remember we hugged, whatever. And then when I went to, Bar- to Laura Bush, I felt really embarrassed and I turned into almost like this little child, like, I'm, I'm sorry if I, I want to almost like to apologize if I hadn't been a good girl. And this is what she did. She went, shh. And she put her finger on my mouth and she said, shh, you did good. And I thought, this woman's not stupid. She knows what happened here. She knew where she was. She knew my politics, and she knew that I tried. And she appreciated the fact that I sought to be nonviolent towards her and towards her husband in the way I delivered my message. Also, she had been an elementary school teacher. And uh, I've always felt about Laura Bush that she was the kind of Texan that I grew up around. Um, boy, how gracious was that? But certainly a lesson for me. So there is a book called Testament of Hope. I don't have it on me at the moment. The Collected Writings, Teachings of Dr. King. I read it cover, I've read it cover to cover more than once. It, it's so great because you just open it anywhere. You know, we all know the famous speeches like the Birmingham jail. I have a dream speech, letter from a Birmingham jail, but there's so much. And you just open it anywhere. And that, to me, I believe is the best way to learn the principles of of, um, nonviolence. I also remember, I'm sure some of you have been to the Lorraine Motel. It is now a museum. And we want to remember that Dr. King, like Gandhi before him, had this prophetic vision. And for that, he was killed. To remember the man, we remember the man as well as the principles. And I think, interestingly enough, I had an experience several years ago that moved me on such a level. I was just happened to be at the Atlanta airport. And if you're ever at the Atlanta airport, there is an area that's like a, a an art museum practically of pieces that belong to Dr. King, et cetera. And one of the things that's there is a business suit, his business suit. He was much shorter, you know, shorter than you would have thought. And he was only 39 years old when he died. Only 39 years old. Bobby Kennedy, I think, was 42, 43. So I remember how impacted I was by his humanity and by the humanity that was expressed in this exhibit. And then somehow I was so impacted by seeing that suit that he wore. We're living at a time when we still have, his children are here who are with us. Unfortunately, Yolanda has passed, but we still have the two sons. We have the daughter, Bernice. Bernice is the CEO of the King Center in Atlanta. Uh, she educates youth and adults about nonviolent principles. Uh, she was only five years old when her father was assassinated. Uh, she herself was the first woman elected president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in 2009. That, of course, was the, was the vehicle for the civil rights movement. Her elder brother, Martin III, and her father had previously held the position. And on May 4th, 1990, Bernice King became the second woman to be ordained at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And I am 
so pleased to be able to say that what you are about to hear is a conversation in which Bernice King is as radiant and as glorious and as powerful as I have ever heard her. Such a testament to the power of her parents and to the legacy of her parents. Settle back, deeply listen, open your mind and open your heart. I present to you, Bernice King. Bernice, thank you so much for coming on and uh, being with me on the podcast today. I'm so grateful. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be with you. I'm always excited to be with you. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. And of course, uh, we have the celebration of Martin Luther King's birthday uh, upon us. I know you have a lot of events going on at the uh, King Center that I want to hear about. But also, Bernice, I feel it's so interesting when we talk to younger people, people who don't have the memories that we have. I was 15 when your father died, and I've already talked earlier about my own memories. You were only five years old. Uh, but you're the daughter. You're a daughter of Dr. King. And also one of the things that I'd love to hear, not only your own thoughts about your father, only your, not only your own thoughts about your uh, the celebration and how we celebrate King Day, but also your mother. You know, your parents were the essence of what we would call today a power couple. Mm-hmm. And I think that as, as history moves forward, I don't think it should be forgotten. And not only your father's contributions, not only his manhood, that you can give us insight into, but also his extraordinary relationship with your mother while he was alive and the way she kept that dream alive afterwards. So take it from there in terms of memories, not only of your father, but also of your mother. Wow. Of course, I have very uh, little memory of of times with my father. Um, I I have one story and a half (laughs) that I always share uh, because it's the story that I can say I experienced that none of my siblings experienced. Uh, in particular, when my father would come back home after traveling so much, by the time I was born, uh, he started traveling even more because that was after the I Have a Dream, after all of the legislation um, and everything had just become, you know, uh, national and international. It was no longer just a Southern movement. And so he would come home and I would run up into his arms and he'd say, OK, we're going to play the kissing game today. And each one of us had a spot, che- uh, the two cheeks, forehead, side of the mouth and the center of the mouth. I was at the forehead. The two brothers were on the cheeks. And then my sister was at the corner of the mouth. My mother obviously smacked dead in the middle. So he called these different spots sugar spots. I asked somebody the other day, what does that mean? Because we used to say, give me some sugar. I don't know what that means, but even to this day, but uh, the kissing. So he said, okay, we're going to play the kissing game. So where is uh, Yoki was my sister's nickname, Yolanda King, who's now deceased. Where is Yoki's uh, spot? And I go to Yoki's spot. And then he go to Martin, who was Marty at the time, Dexter, me and, and my mom. And it was just our time of bonding. And really, when he uh, was assassinated, probably up until the age of 9, 10, or 11, I remembered it as if it were yesterday. I mean, I, you know, I could, I, I, I knew, nobody told me. A lot of things were shared with me. Um, a lot of things I heard my siblings share, but I knew this myself. Uh, the other thing that I, I vividly remember is the dinner table. Um, we would sit at the dinner table. And of course, when I was between probably uh, uh, a few months to maybe three years of age, I would sit in between my mom and dad kind of on the edge. My dad would be at the head. I kind of sat at the, the edge and then my mom. And I just remember distinctly that there were these long green stem onions that he would pick up before he said the blessing. And he would chew on them like celery sticks. Now, that's weird. But, you know, children, as we all know, look at everything that people are doing. They just kind of observe and like, what is that? Uh, But I remember that. I just remember being at the dinner table quite um, often. Uh, And I have a vague memory of riding my tricycle in in the driveway one day while he and my brothers were on their bikes. 
And they went out into the street. And of course, I was supposed to be in the driveway riding my tricycle around. And I tried to go follow. <laughs> of course, he took he he would look back and he you know he took me and kind of shook me and said no you can't do that. <laughs> um, so those are the memories that I can say uh, I have that nobody told me. Of course, I have tons of memory of my mom. I mean, the thing I I hold very near and dear is she was very consistent with invoking their values and their teachings in our home, especially around dinner time. Um, and even re- repeating some of his words to us, like, you know, she would, she would repeat the scripture that he talked about a lot about, he will be greatest among you, must be the servant of you all. Uh, so she talked about service to humanity. When my father died, she talked a lot to us about not hating uh, the person who killed our father. Uh, and of course, my grandfather, along with my mother, my father's father, you know, talked about hate and how he would never stoop so low as to hate any person. My grandfather and my mother would often remind us, of, you know, the hate is too great a burden to bear. We hear about that quote today. The one quote that is not necessarily a quote from my father's, but something she would say to us consistently, somebody has to cut off the chain of violence. Of course, as I grew older, I understood she was really saying, Bernice, you have to be the one to stop that cycle, that you can't participate in perpetuating violence. You can't add fuel to the fire, so to speak. Um, and the best one had was just her way of affirming us, because being the children of such famous parents, not just a father, famous parents, it's a tremendous burden. Um, great expectations. You know, people do this to all children. They kind of compare you a little bit either to your other siblings or to your parents. Uh, But who wants to really be compared (laughs) to Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King? Um, Because they just, they they made the kind of contributions that live. They live with us today, you know, every day. Uh, And so she would say to us, look, Whatever you do in this life, I want you to just be your best self. You don't have to be your father and you don't have to be me. That has really uh, helped me a great deal um, when I feel that sense of, of burden um, and weight and heaviness. Uh, because I have within me, like maybe most children as they grow older, this desire to want to do as much or more than my parents. But I check myself and recognize, look, my parents were such a gift to this universe. And what they gave us is something that has to continue and be perpetuated because much of what they did and much of what my father spoke about was so prophetic. They were so uh, profoundly gifted as seers. They could see, you know, years later. And so we're catching up. And therefore, somebody has to continue that work. Uh, So I say to people, when you ask me, what is my legacy? I say, I really don't have a legacy because I inherited a legacy. And I am trying to continue to perpetuate that legacy, build upon it, of course, and help to further interpret it for the generation that I'm living in, uh, because there's so many things that are not finished, not complete. Uh, And so, you know, that's, that's been my, my life. um, And I'm committed to it. I mean, I can't do, I, man, I tried to do so many other things before when I was younger, I wanted to be (laughs) an anchor person. I wanted to be a radio DJ. (laughs) I want to do anything and get away from all of this, but um, it's, it's my assignment. And um, I, uh, i when my mother passed in 2006, I was with her in Mexico um, when she took her last breaths. And uh, I really felt some transfer in that room that day. And from that point on, I wasn't res- resistant um, and trying to, you know, figure it all out some way else. I realized, oh my God, the person who was the face of this 
wonderful legacy is now gone and it's on us. The four of us at the time because my sister was still living. So I said, Bernice, you gotta, you really have to grow up now. <laughs> and I was about 42 at that time. Well, I think you do an extraordinary job, not only of keeping the legacy alive, but of creating your own legacy. Because you, of all the children, are are the one who specifically, being an ordained minister yourself, you contextualize your father's politics within the spiritual and religious tradition that he emerged from in a way that I think is so important. And many people, when they think about keeping the legacy alive, do not emphasize the spiritual and religious as much as you do. That's one of the reasons why I love this book, one of the reasons why I've always been interested in your work. I I had a really good time one day hanging out with Yolanda. I remember yeah. that. Uh, yeah. I did have the honor of meeting your mother uh, and and your brother, uh, Martin. But your work is the one, uh, in addition to the conversations that we've had, I've always been very attentive to because of the, of the spiritual and the religious component. Now, in the book, one of the things you talk about is the prophetic tradition. And you talk about your father as a prophet. You talk about how prophets are seen, how we should not forget how your father was treated by many. Uh, and I think that relates to how he is remembered and your thoughts about how America celebrates Martin Luther King Day today. I think that this is another one of the issues where we want to make sure that the, the youngins know um, yeah. making Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, a day, a holiday, was a, took, took many years. I remember Stevie Wonder very active in that, correct, along with your mother. So h- how do you feel about the role of the prophet? One of the things you say in your book is we need prophets now. Uh, Not only you carrying along the legacy, but all of us uh, who understand your father's words and particularly see the urgency of 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 his principles as they apply to America today. Yeah, it is a lot. But, you know, um, the the sermon title actually was 25 years after his uh, assassination that I had an opportunity to speak at our annual uh, ecumenical service, which is now we call it a commemorative service. and. Um, I specifically titled a prophet without honor, uh, based off of the scripture where, where Jesus in his own hometown was not really honored. He said, everywhere else you're honored, but within your own hometown, you're not. And I said, if we're going to honor Dr. King, who was a prophet, he not only just told truths that that what we say in the language today, speak truth to power. He had an ability to point us in a direction and guide us to those, uh, important, uh, lasting, timeless principles spiritually that would keep our world going in the direction of progress that uplifts humanity and ensures that there's dignity of the personhood. And so um, I, I was reminding people that we, you know, we are honoring him today with this wonderful holiday. Um, but the, But at the end of the day, we do a disservice if we don't honor him with our life. I mean, to, to, to just honor the man and not be committed to his mission undermines the whole essence of what the holiday is about. Um, we have to take his words. We have to take them seriously. I mean, I feel myself sometimes having to repeat myself on certain things that, you know, he, he said or he wrote about. Because I think people are missing it. We kind of like to, to to gravitate towards the things that, you know, tickle our ears or kind of sanitize the power uh, of his legacy. I mean, he was very edgy and he was very uh, radical and revolutionary in the sense that when he spoke, he was speaking about transforming not just people in their hearts, but literally transforming systems. That's what revolution was to him. In fact, he talked about it. If it's a revolt if you just move people, you know, move them by their emotion. But it's a revolution when you transform people and systems. So that means he understood very clearly that what was happening outwardly in our universe, there's something that has to happen to us in our inner person, that spirit person that has to align with, you know, progress. So he wrote about how technology. We had advanced technologically, scientifically in his book, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community. But how morally and spiritually there's a great lag 
because we became, you know, enamored with materialism, excessive materialism, um, with um, um, racism and and militarism, uh, instead of becoming in love with humanity and ensuring that we have a loyalty to to humanity and and what's best for humanity in terms of their dignity, worth, and value, and that there is justice and equity uh, for all people. Uh, And so, you know, we need people today who not just speak for truth, but also have the ability to understand in the Bible, there was a tribe called the Issacharian tribe. They understood the times and knew what to do. So they were able to see further than the now and to point people in the right direction. Because I think about it, when I read his words now, it's eerie. I don't know about for you, but it's like, God, it's like, is he here right now with us? So he was transcendent, you know? And part of that was because he was deeply spiritual. He prayed about everything. Um, And he lived out of his spirit person. And I think if more of us, particularly those of us who have a call um, and understand that call. It doesn't have to be as somebody who preaches in a pulpit, but you understand that you have a call in this life to make a difference in uplifting, advancing humanity. You have to live out of your spirit person because your spirit person is aligned with, you know, a higher consciousness. Um, it is aligned with those, those timeless values. Um, and so this was this was some of the stuff I was trying to convey. And as we celebrate the holiday last year, literally, Marianne, I've, I've done the call to commemoration at our service for maybe the last three or four years. And literally, the Holy Spirit said, tell the people that a day on is not enough. Because, you know, and, 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 and I say this in a, in a reverence to my mother, but an, an area that I think uh, she kind of led us into this day on process. You know, they were looking at how do we get everybody involved in the King holiday of the day of service. And I struggled with it as her daughter, as a part of the legacy, because I always understood that for him, it was really about sacrifice. You know, it was about laying yourself bare, uh, before, you know, humanity and being an instrument of God and a force for change and, and transformation and, and being vulnerable enough uh, to speak things that people don't necessarily want to hear, but they must hear for our, for our total healing uh, and ultimately reconciliation. And so last year, I just I, I gave this message about it wasn't enough, that we have to really commit our lives to, to sacrificing for those things that he represented. Uh, and so I try not to focus heavily, even though people reach all the time. I just got something to do recently and I'm wrestling, you know, with do I really want to do this? Because my message now is, look, we got to work for justice. We got to work for equity. And if we're going to do days of service, while we will always need some of those, you know, you know, planting of you know, uh, uh, flowers, uh, visiting the nursing home, all of that is needed. But I think I think we've done that. And I think we understand that that's something that we will continue to do. But more importantly, we've got to start looking at our, our service, if you want to use the word, in terms of aligning with institutions, organizations, and efforts that are working towards creating this just and humane and equitable world. So people who are doing that kind of work, who are addressing systemic racism, that's where we align with, and not just on the King holiday. The King holiday, for me, is a time to reassess, you know, how much have we progressed from the last year? But I think it's a blessing that it's at the beginning of the year, because Everybody thinks about, okay, this is a new year. What am I going to do different? How am I going to change? What are going to be my goals? So, wow, he's born right at the beginning. And it's an opportune time for us to really set a tone and a direction for the nation. 
Well, and also every four years, it coincides almost to the day with the inauguration of the next uh, presidential administration. And you you said several times just now that your father spoke from his spirit person. Uh, And of course, one of his most famous lines was that we need quantitative change in our circumstances and qualitative changes in our souls. So, so essential to the philosophy of nonviolence and the work of your father, am I right, is the interface interaction and absolutely essential connection between acting from the spirit in a way that makes you more powerful in the world, more courageous in the world, wiser in the world. He said, the desegregation of the American South is the externalization, political externalization of the goal of the civil rights community. But the ultimate goal is the establishment of the beloved community. Yeah. Because he knew that if you don't establish the beloved community, you might desegregate the American South, but that was just a symptom and it will morph into a new one. And he would call that negative peace. Negative peace, right. No uh, no outward violence, but an underlying tension and anxiety, right? Exactly. And the absence of justice. Right. And brotherhood. So... Tell me more about the beloved community and the work that the that the King Center is doing this year around the theme of the beloved community. Yeah. So last year we had as a theme um, uh, the fierce urgency of now. You know, he spoke about that um, in the "I Have a Dream" speech, and he also spoke about it in um, the Birmingham letter, the letter from the Birmingham jail. Uh, and at that time, we we our theme said the fierce urgency of now, the beloved community. So this year. We just said the urgency of creating the beloved community. When we look at how much we have become more polarized and more divided and and really have accepted this whole notion of just throwing people away, I, I just have a commitment and a belief that we have to always present a higher uh, consciousness to let people aspire to. And some of us have to pay the sacrifice for that. That's what nonviolence was about. It was about making a voluntary commitment to become a sacrifice so that you can use the strength of your being and your presence and your ability to not retaliate, to expose the evil. Um, And, you know, that obviously happened many times. And so the beloved community is really about um, creating a community that reflects, obviously is fueled by love, uh, agape, unconditional love, the love of God operating in and through our human heart. And it operates through our thinking, you know, it operates through our speaking, it operates through our acting, it operates through our policies. You know, dad talks about, um, um, love correcting everything that stands against love, true love, true, 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 true power. Is it power? True, true. I, I have to find that quote. It's a very powerful uh, quote that he talked about how love has to correct or power. In one instance, he said, has to correct everything that stands against love. So this community of, of love and respect and understanding and dignity and value and worth and and ensuring there's justice and and equity and a sharing of resources um, is is what we work toward. And we don't seek to look for what you just said, quieting down tension. There's conflict in the beloved community, but you find ways to work towards peaceful resolution with with your eyesight on reconciliation um, with your um, adversaries. And so it's not about a community where everybody thinks alike um, and everybody likes each other because you can not like people in the beloved community. You must love them. You know, you respect their personhood. Um, You have an understanding and a care and a compassion um, and you ensure that everything that you do um, is is geared towards their best interest that for the good of, of all. Uh, and so as we have been focusing it on an as an institution on that goal, the ultimate goal of my father's work from the very beginning, because he talked about 
the beloved community early on when the boycott started. You know, the aftermath of nonviolence is uh, a redemption. The aftermath is the creation, is reconciliation. The aftermath is the creation of the beloved community. He said that in 55 when they started. So everything was laced with that for him. So he was thinking about, at the end of the day, I want to win people over. At the end of the day, I want to ensure that they're win-win pathways. At the end of the day, I'm not seeking to destroy people, but I am seeking to destroy evil, injustice, you know, those, those issues. Um, at the end of the day, I'm seeking to create an opportunity for us to be in a state where we can reconcile with each other, um, create community in essence. And so as a part of that, we've aligned our institution under the banner of the beloved community. So this year we're doing a lot of programmatic thrust during the King holiday under that banner. So as we've had previously, we have a beloved community teaching for schools all across the world. People can go onto our website, thekingcenter.org. Uh, we have lesson plans, toolkits that people can utilize and download and, and on January 15th, the actual birthday of my father, and teach these lessons to their students, K through 12. Uh, it's available for every every student from K through 12, school districts, you know, school systems, schools, individual schools. They can go there and find that. So that's the Beloved Community Teaching. We had the Beloved Community Awards, which was formerly the Salute to Greatness Awards. Uh, excited about that. We're honoring some 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 dynamic people. You know, Reverend uh, William Barber, he's, he's going to be participating in it. Brian Stevenson is going to be closing it out uh, because we are going to be talking about one of the first places we start with creating a beloved community is truth telling. And he's doing all these truth telling commissions. So we're working uh, with the Equal Justice Initiative along with that. And I'm kicking off the summit. Uh, and we have some other people uh, that will be participating. They are different political affiliations. They're having a conversation around social justice because uh, we try to make our service ecumenical and, and nonpartisan because it really is about lifting up the human spirit and lifting up the potential of the human spirit and really looking at those things that daddy talked about that I think everybody's concerned about. We're just confused with how to get there and we're not in touch, more importantly, with our spirit person. You know, I think you can't be in touch with your spirit person and accept some of the circumstances that we see and witness in this society, you know, from from poverty, you know, from inequity, economic inequity. From I, I, I mean, it bothers me deeply that people are, I, I know we're in a pandemic now, before the pandemic, that people have to work two or three jobs, you know, just to try to make ends meet and still don't meet. I mean, what does that say about us in terms of us? Civil, being civilized. I love that you just said that when you are in touch with your spirit person, you cannot tolerate unjust systems. And I think that's so important because some people, and this was true even when your father was alive, some of the conversation between uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Malcolm X, I think this changed during during their lifetime, but felt that your father wasn't wasn't tough enough, that this spiritual stuff was, was too soft. Yeah, yeah. And yet what your father proved and embodied, as do you and others, is that being in touch with your spirit person is what gives you uh, the ability to name what needs to be named, the courage to do so, and the absolute refusal to keep your mouth shut. As your father said, your life begins to end on the day you stop talking about things that matter. And stand in the face of hostility and hate. I've read your father's work. I feel that I understand it in my heart. I've read Gandhi. I understand, as Gandhi said, the end is inherent in the means. But what do you say to people who are listening now who say, how do I love Mitch McConnell? How how do I love people in, in Congress who are voting against any direct cash relief to people who do not know how to feed their children right now, who do not know if they will be evicted from their apartments, who honestly do not are living in such despair about what's happening now and who know that this societal neglect the way that they are being neglected during this pandemic is really just an extension of the systemic neglect that they were experiencing even before the pandemic. A lot of people would be listening to you and saying, how do I love them for this? 
You know, first of all, I don't have the capacity in myself to love. I think you're doing a real good job. Well, I'm, I'm saying what I mean by that is my alignment with God enables me to love beyond my capacity. Um, because God created the whole universe. He created us. He knows us. And he knows all of what people are dealing with. And so I have to draw upon his love in my heart. So all those people who are angry at Mitch McConnell, you know, generally he might know people are angry, but he doesn't know you specifically. And so we have to be careful that we don't allow our vessels to become tainted and poisoned with his behavior so that we can remain clear and open to be vessels of change and transformation and not do it in a hateful way ourselves. I said, we have to act out of our spirit person that comes from a higher place where God is able to connect with us and dispense that love in the universe. But if we are laden with hate and anger and fear, that can't even happen. So transfer, you know, the anger or channel it into nonviolent action. That's what daddy was doing when he, he, he understood the anger. I understand. Look, I have moments. It's okay to be angry. <laughs> it's, if, if you're not angry, something's wrong with you. So first of all, don't feel bad about angry. I'm not mad uh, or, or think there's a, an issue with the person being angry. I'm, I don't ever want to get rid of a person's anger. I want to channel the anger. I want to get rid of the kind of anger that would be self-destructive. But I want to make sure you channel that into something that is more positive uh, so that you can be a force to be reckoned with. Uh, so take that anger and, and, and find ways to connect. Again, if, if we are engaged in actions that are working towards change, it makes it better. Otherwise, idle mind, you know, people are my idle mind, be the devil's work with God. Otherwise, every time you hear something, you're just going to take that in and it's just going to continue to affect you. And if you're not using your energy in another way, it's going to eventually, you know, poison your being. Uh, so I say to people, get connected, get connected again, as I said earlier, to these organizations, to these entities, to these efforts that are happening. You, you know, you don't have to create your own. There's a lot going on that just needs bolstering. You know, it needs some more people. <laughs> it needs some more gifts. You know, it needs your strengths. So that's that's what I would say to people, um, to be honest with you, Marianne, uh, because Mitch McConnell's come and go. And there will always be one. There will always be one. Yeah. Until we get to that point of consciousness. And there will always be one. Yeah. But if and, and we have to be zealous. Remember what daddy said. He said, one of the tragedies still of human history is that the children of darkness are often more zealous and determined than the children of light. And I'm on a mission to disprove him. I, I embrace most of his words, but that's one I want to disprove him on, that the children of darkness are not more zealous and determined because we're going to turn that around as children of light and understand that we have to remain vigilant. We can't let our we can't let up at any point. Well, your father said, uh, God said, I have to love my enemies. He didn't say, I have to like them. Like them, exactly. Conviction is a force multiplier. I do believe there are a lot more lovers than haters in this country and in this world. But it's true. The, those who hate, hate with greater conviction today than is being displayed by those who love. And when we see hatred as the primary motivator for our for our political activism, it's like white sugar. It 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 gives you an adrenaline high, but then you crash. And we need a nourishment for the kind of political activism, which is moral outrage, yes, but that's born of love and, and not of hate. And I love your answer that finding the love which will enable us to love even those that we do not like is really itself a gift of God. And that's why you pray in the morning and you you work with one of these organizations and you're an activist in the afternoon. And that, I think, is what your father meant, right? By that, that quantitative change and the qualitative change. 
And it's daily. It's daily. You have to replenish yourself daily. Absolutely. It's like you wake up in the morning, you take a shower because you want to get rid of yesterday's dirt. You pray and meditate because you want to get rid of all that poison and that toxicity and that stress that diminishes our capacity to be effective and and diminishes the quality of our lives. Um, You spoke earlier about the question of billionaires, about someone who had been a billionaire. There are over 600 billionaires in America today. And the 400 richest people in the United States have an average of of $6 billion each. Your father would look at this. And this is, once again, this is the reflection of the unbelievable income inequality that exists in our country today. I have said many times, Bernice, um, that with most people, and I think you and I have had this conversation as well, most people... They passed on this earth, and every year, to some extent, it gets a little easier to bear. But for me, and I feel this way about your father, I also feel this way about Bobby Kennedy. In a way, it gets worse every year because everything we were afraid might happen when they were no longer here has come to pass. Mm. Ways in which things are not better. I understand the ways in which they're better. I understand the value of the, of the of desegregation. I understand the importance of the Civil Rights uh, Act. I understand the importance of the Voting Rights Act, although let's not kid ourselves, even that has been chipped away at. But I think many of the things, and you write about this also, many of the situations with violence and so forth today, your father would be horrified by. And in your book, you gave a sermon and you named this the Midnight Hour. Tell us about the Midnight Hour. Tell us how to endure the midnight hour. You're a fantastic vessel for your father's legacy. And I also think, and I I just, I'm sure everybody says this to you, but just physically, you are this beautiful woman's face that's the Martin Luther King face. It's such an amazing assignment you have this lifetime. So tell me about the midnight hour. What would your father feel about the midnight hour? What do you feel about the midnight hour and how do we endure it? My mother used to always say to me, baby, because she would call me baby a lot, the darkest hour is before the dawn. And she would give me examples of things that they went through in the movement where it was very dark. For instance, in Montgomery, when they had issued an injunction against the carpools, the destruction of the carpools would have made that boycott almost next to impossible because now people would not be able to get around. And just in a moment, God breathes through the Supreme Court because there had been a case that had had gone through the legal process and gotten to the Supreme Court. And that decision came down and I say it this way, in a nick of time. There are, what they, there are these things called kairos moments where God intercepts time. And that's why faith is so important beyond your ability. I think too many people are looking at their own individual abilities or maybe even just people ability, but there is a force in our universe that works towards what's right and what's just no matter how, quote unquote, dark it gets, there will be a breakthrough, a daybreak, so to speak, that comes. And if you allow yourself to remember points and moments in history, we've seen dark moments before. And we think our moment is the darkest. I'm sure every generation thinks that. (laughs) Oh, this is some dark this is a dark time. Are we going to be able to be delivered from this? The children of Israel probably felt like that in the Bible. Um, But the remembrance that we've been here, if we can just remain faithful to being children of light and working towards what the universe is aligned with, which is justice, equity, goodness, all those things, that there's going to be a moment that we don't control. I mean, the movement was a moment. It was one of those cows moments. Rosa Parks, 
You had Claudette Colvin before that and so many others. But it wasn't the moment because things have to align in the universe. So Rosa had to align. Daddy had to align with that because he became the chosen person to be the leader. And the people had to be at a certain point of exasperation. All of that stuff happens and we don't control it. But what we do control is our faith, our belief, our actions, our speaking, because we can speak things even into existence. And so for me, that's how you deal with the dark hour. What did dad say? Out with this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain. Mountains are typically immovable. We'll be able to hew out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. We've all had dark moments in our lives. And we probably didn't think we were going to survive them. And look, we survived. We, some people didn't, of course. But we survived 2020. And there was a change. People don't forget. There was a change because people were concerned another four years of a leader like, or let me say it this way, of a person like President Trump because he hasn't been exercising true leadership. That's a whole other story. They didn't didn't know what would happen. But look, that moment came and intercepted your faithfulness. People showed up at the polls. And even to that, you know, people showed up even over and over again at the polls every time. We made, we broke records this year, last year. (laughs) <laughs> with the election. So, hey, don't despair. Just remain faithful and know that you're not alone, that there is a force and people in the universe that are working right along with you. I tell you, I hope everybody who is listening is aware of how profound it is that Martin Luther King's daughter is telling us not to despair. Uh, one of his most brilliant lines uh from the, I assume it was the acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize in Norway, in Oslo in 1964, when he said that he feels that evil, even when evil is is temporarily successful, that the light will prevail. And that, of course, within all the great religious traditions, within Christianity, the, the crucifixion is just part of the journey. The resurrection is always always on the other side of that experience. In the Jewish tradition, uh, yes, there was the, uh, the Pharaoh's enslavement of the Israelites, but then there was the entrance to the promised land. The moral arc of the universe is long, correct, but it bends towards justice, and we need to be the benders, right? Yes, we do. We have to keep bending because and, and it's, not, it's not a waste of time. You're not doing it in vain. It seems to me, you know, it's so profound what you were talking about, those Kairos moments. And there are those Kairos moments, Kairos moments, and there are individuals chosen by God. And there was a time in this country, there was this genius cluster. Um, There was John Kennedy, there was Martin, there was there was Bobby. We, We all know that. We may not have today the individuals that represent God's ecstatic, Shakti, chosen one. But wouldn't you agree that this is almost like the zeitgeist is a collective? It is. You stand up as best you can, and I stand up as best I can. Somebody else stands up as best they can. That all of us just stand up a little more than we're standing now. A little more conviction than we have displayed so far. And it seems to me it's not so much now about the soloists, perhaps, but the song itself, the collective song. As all of us do remember what the truly great ones among us have said and find a little bit of that greatness within ourselves. That's the moment that we're living in, isn't it? It definitely is. And as you were talking, I thought about two specific things. I thought about how Nehemiah built the wall with everybody engaged and in record time. It was something that, you know, would have taken forever to do. And they did it in a short period of time, less than um, two months. Um, and that's because the collective energy and people working in their area of strength, familiarity, um, and um, that's what makes this beautiful. We don't have to look to a messiah 
<laughs> you know, it, it, what is it saying? We're the ones we've been waiting for. That's very true. But I want to share something. I think I shared this with you before that um, unity is powerful. And I don't think people understand how powerful it is because unity can work toward good or evil. I remember, um, and, and you know, we can look at all of the natural things surrounding it to explain it, that maybe somebody cheated here or somebody cheated there. But again, let's go back to what I said about the power of unity. Unity can be used in a negative way and it can be used in a positive way. So a few years, a couple of years, three, two or three years ago, we had an, an, uh, an election here in Georgia for the governor. And then Stacey Abrams ran against Brian Kemp. And before it got to Brian Kemp, it was Brian Kemp and Casey Cagle. And they were in um, um, the race and, and, and Brian Kemp won against Casey Cagle in the runoff. Well, the next day, the next night, within less than 24 hours, maybe about 22, 21 hours, Brian Kemp was on a stage and every single Republican leader was at that rally or standing on that stage. The person he defeated, Casey Cagle, uh, the head of the, uh, the, um, the, the House here in the state of Georgia, um, uh, Representative Ralston, the head of the Republican Party, both of our Republican senators, they were all aligned behind Brian Kemp. And I remember watching the, the news uh, uh, story and I said, oh my God, he's going to win because of what I see there, that unity that I did not see in the Democratic Party at that time. So yes, that Zyko's that collective, that when, when we come together in unity and aligned around an agenda and we're working in our territory of strength, wow, nothing will be able to stop us. Not evil itself. It will try, you know, yeah, it may throw certain things this way or that way, like they did with my father in the movement, curveballs and try to stop you at every twist and turn. But in the end, as Daddy said, unarmed truth and unconditional love will win. We're going to wake up tomorrow morning with the same faith, and we're going to know in our hearts that ultimately the outcome will be an, out an outcome of love and justice and the world that we all want to see. I, uh, I'm so grateful, so grateful to you, Bernice, that you would give us this time. And like I said, you've, it, was, it was such a gift, uh, everything about not only the, the facts you were sharing, but the spirit that was clearly uh, moving through you. It was, uh, this has been an awesome hour. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to share before we uh, let everybody just absorb what you share with us today? I, I think I, I just want to say something very simple to people is don't give up hope. Part of not giving up hope is understanding that the answer lies within you. Um, many times we look outwardly for a Messiah, a deliverer. And over and over again, I think we have deferred ourselves as a citizenry to political leadership to carry us forward. No, we have to work in concert with them. And sometimes we have to work in a way that challenges and pushes them, but we have to work. We can't lay back and just go into our own little silo and be detached from what is happening in our nation and world. Um, be the hope by being active and being involved and never again be on the sideline of being engaged uh, as a voter, as a informed voter, as a, as a um, uh, engaged citizen, knowing that getting people into office is one step, but keeping up with what's happening so we don't get surprised by what happened with the Voting Rights Act. We never should. Some of us were surprised by that because we didn't know. 
and it was quietly happening. We have to be active and we have to make sure that we continue to make ensure that people know what is happening from day to day. That's why I thank God for social media because it has enabled us to know things that are happening that we're not going to get in mainstream media. Don't absorb yourself in a, a source. I'm not sure with the Supreme Court today that there would have been the same decision of Brown versus Board Brown versus Board of Education. I'm not sure we don't have a Plessy versus Ferguson court today. Thurgood Marshall was a human rights lawyer. Can you imagine a human rights lawyer being appointed to Supreme Court justice today? And that's why electoral politics matters so much. Uh, Your father certainly knew that. Also, one of the stories I think we want to remember, and this goes along with what you were talking about, how you love people, but you do name what needs to be named. You do hold people accountable. Uh, There's a famous anecdote, of course, when JFK said to your father, when your father said to John F. Kennedy, I'm sorry I have to be so tough on you out there and the things I say. And President Kennedy said, please do, because the fact that you're being so tough on me is what's giving me the political cover to do some of the things I'm trying to do. Exactly. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I know I say thank you. I know thank you is on the heart of so many people who are listening right now, who are watching right now, uh, who are going to go to the King Center, what the kingcenter.org, right? It's kingcenter.org to find out all of the beloved community events we're having. Yes. And we'll remember, all of us will remember what you said. It can't just be one day. It can't just be one weekend. It's got to be a way of life. That's what nonviolence is. A way of life. Yes, definitely. A way of life. All my love to you. Many, many thanks to you. My love to you as well. And uh, sincerely, I can't wait till we do it again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marianne. Well, you know, after we taped this podcast, this conversation with Bernice King, everybody on our team talked about how privileged we were to have heard her speak the words that she spoke with the kind of spirit and passion with which she spoke them. And I'm sure that you feel the same way. What an honor to have her here with us and to share what she has shared. I'm sure that her parents are wherever they are. So very, very proud. Remember to go to thekingcenter.org to learn about all the events that will be taking place uh, in honor this year of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Remember the theme, the beloved community. And uh, let's also attend to Bernice's words today, that honoring Martin Luther King's words, life and legacy, is something we don't want to just do once a year, but every day of every year. Now, time for Ask Marianne. You can write me questions at marianne at castmedia.com. Let's get started. I am a professor at a college in Boston, and I am horrified by the far-left indoctrination, censorship, and bullying that I witness almost daily on campus. Most colleges today have zero tolerance for healthy debate, conservative values of any kind, and Western traditions in general. We're told that we uphold that they uphold the premises of white supremacy. We're taught not to teach Shakespeare, for example, because he was a cisgendered white man and his works aren't accessible to all. To me, this is narrow-minded, anti-intellectual, and just plain false. And if the public really knew what was going on in education, they'd be appalled as well. I'm a classic liberal, but what I'm seeing is not liberalism. It is illiberal, cancel culture, and anti-white. I agree with Trump on the excesses of critical race theory. I think he was right to shut it down on the federal level, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the issue. Identity politics are destroying the left. Not every disparity is the result of race and gender, and I worry that we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to the far left's desire to destroy Western civilization. Most white people are not racist, and the U.S. is not an oppressive regime for women, as we're often led to believe on campus. Spiritually speaking, aren't we to focus on the content of the character and inner life slash communion with God rather than the immutable traits of our externals? Please help. Thank you. Anonymous, because it's literally not safe to say my name and show my dissent to the far-left narrative. Thank you. Okay, so let's start with some basics. President Eisenhower said, and I believe uh, as well, that the American mind at its best is both liberal and conservative. There are high-minded conservative values. 
there are high-minded liberal values. And you don't have a free society if everybody has to think the same way. So high-minded liberal values have a place in the, in the marketplace of ideas. And high-minded conservative values also have a place in the marketplace of ideas. And anytime either side of the political spectrum wants to shut down the voices from the other side of the political spectrum, then I agree with the writer of this letter that we have a problem. The idea that you're not going to teach Shakespeare because he's a cisgendered white man and his work isn't accessible to all is outrageous. A couple of times I quoted Gandhi on Twitter and was told that, you know, according to some book, he slept with a niece. Therefore, we can't talk about Gandhi. Apparently, we don't really want to study Jefferson anymore. Yes, Jefferson definitely was with Sally Hemings. I'm very aware of the story. But I don't think we want to not understand the ideas of Thomas Jefferson. The ideas of Thomas Jefferson are the basis of the freedom by which we can even be having this conversation. So I am, like this person says, I'm a classic liberal. Anybody who knows my politics knows that I'm my political beliefs are on the left side of the political spectrum. And when it comes to race, you know, my book, Healing of America, came out in 1998. I, I, I was down talking about reparations, talking about mass incarceration, talking about racial disparity in sentencing, et cetera, back, way back in the last century. So I, I feel that I am as, as much as a white woman can be, because I think there's a level of experience you can't have from without a system, outside the system. But for a white person, and we're always learning, of course, but this is not like on whatever level I'm capable, my eyes are not open. But I agree with this writer in many, many ways. And, it, and I want to say on the issue of race, it has been my experience, and it was my experience on the campaign trail as well. And I've traveled all over this country. It is not my experience that the average American voter is a racist person. And I understand that it's not about racist people, it's about racist systems. I understand that the systems are racist. I understand that there is systemic racism. But I also feel that that's a different conversation than the average American. I don't believe the average American is a racist in their heart. I believe, however, that the average American is deeply undereducated about the history of race. Do we have to have way more conversation? Absolutely. I found when I was on the campaign trail that it was, you could take an average white person who's like, well, I don't want to hear about reparations. And I would give them a 10 minute spiel starting talking about how the first slave ships came over in 1619 to almost 250 years of slavery, between four and 5 million enslaved people at the end of the civil war followed for the most part, except for 12 years of reconstruction by another hundred years of domestic terrorism and violence perpetrated against the, the black people in America. When you actually talk about the history, what the Civil Rights Act did and did not do, what the Voting Rights Act did, but now how so much of that has been chipped away at, the economic disparity that existed at the end of the Civil War that was never, the gap never closed, the fact that Martin Luther King's assassination cut that conversation off. In my experience, people are open to hearing that. That's what we have to have. We have to have those conversations. But you don't get there by shutting down other conversations. Fascist conversations, hate-filled conversations, that I understand. But Shakespeare is not a hate-filled conversation. And yes, when it comes to race in America, we really need to name it. And our conversation here today with Bernice, M Martin Luther King Jr. is, a, is, is, is such, a, such a paragon of virtue when it comes to naming racial inequity and what needs to be done about it. And let's remember, that he spoke about all people. And he spoke to the heart of all people. And that's the way he was, the reason he was able to put together the coalition of conscience that he was. So I hope that this is a phase that will pass. Because what this writer is talking about is undeniably in, in many ways true. And I could, you know, say about some of these issues, well, I don't, you know, when you say the far left wants to destroy Western civilization, I don't think 
the far left wants to destroy America, Western civilization. This is how I see it. I think people on the right, a lot of times, only want to talk about what America has done right and have no listening for the necessary conversations about our shadows, including racial injustice that has been like a river of evil beneath the, the, the ground throughout our history. But I also feel with some people on the left that they have no listening for what America's ever done right. And the truth of the matter is every generation is made up of people. And we have had, that is both the tragedy, the irony, and the glory of the United States, is that struggle that has always been with us. You had, out of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, all of whom were risking their lives, because if they had lost the war, they would have been executed as traitors against the King of England. On one hand, they all risked their lives to establish these extraordinary principles of freedom and liberty in the Declaration of Independence, and 41 of them were slave owners. So that struggle has always been with us. But the answer in any generation to winning that struggle for the forces of light and love is not to try to shut people up. That's a form, it's like book burning. There's something wrong about it. The whole point of freedom, free speech, free press. And I also feel we have people today in America who are serious haters, who are serious fascists who would seriously commit violence. But just because somebody isn't on the same side of the political spectrum doesn't mean they're one of those. Somebody wanting to read Shakespeare? Uh, this, is, this is like, we, we all have to like go back to our hearts and grow up a little here and read American history and know that, yes, we have a very, very, very very uh, deep problem with racial injustice. Not only that used to be here, but that is here. And you better believe we need to address it, and God help us if we don't. But remember the line from Martin Luther King, you have very little morally persuasive power with people who can feel your underlying contempt. And people who can feel our contempt will not hear us. And if good people who just happen to disagree with us, their only sin is that they don't see things the way we do, they feel we're trying to shut them up, all you're going to be doing in a case like that is abetting, aiding and abetting the very forces that we need most to be concerned about. So let's all try monitoring other people a little bit less and monitoring ourselves a whole lot more. It's interesting that this came in today because nothing nothing could be more relevant to the issue of nonviolence. An angry generation will not bring peace to the world. We have to take our anger and channel it into activism, but that activism cannot be shutting down the voices of those with whom we do not agree. This is from Ashton. Hi, Marianne and team. I hope you're all well. I'm so glad I found this podcast. I've long admired your work, but the most recent episode regarding the biology of belief left me stumped on one idea, chronic pain or conditions that do not yet have a cure. For background, I believe in the power of our thoughts to heal our bodies. I'm proof myself. After falling and breaking my spinal column and severely fraying the spinal cord, I maintained my ability to walk. Praise God on that. And with the help of surgery, was not paralyzed. Wow. I still have pain from time to time and have physical limits, but I focus more on the quality of my life. All of this is a long way of asking for your advice on how to help my 47-year-old dad, who received a diagnosis of Parkinson's on December 24th, 2019. He survived cancer three times. He was abused physically, psychologically, and emotionally as a child, worked in a toxic environment where he had to crawl through toxic sludge and has had concussions in the double digits. I understand that genetics are not everything. We don't have a family history of PD, Parkinson's, but I believe his Parkinson's is a result of an extremely traumatic and stressful life. He has PTSD and doesn't do anything to treat it beyond speaking to us. He often doesn't believe he is loved, 
and often he is in immense pain that he works through outside on our farm. What can I do to help him while not delegitimizing his pain or lying to him and saying positive affirmations will cure him? I think we can extend and improve his life, but I'm stuck on how to Im- approach this subject. We're very honest about death in this house, but we are collectively mourning a lost future. I would appreciate any advice or thoughts you have on the matter. I'm so sorry, Ashton, and I'm very moved by the poignancy of your love for your father. Your father should not have had to crawl through toxic sludge in the United States of America. I'll tell you that much. Right now, you know, he was diagnosed just a little over a year ago. He's still taking this all in. He's had three cancer diagnoses. He's a young man still. Of course, he's traumatized by this. This isn't just post-traumatic stress from his childhood. This is present traumatic stress from what he's going through now. And you're right. You know, affirmations aren't going to heal him, are going to, you know, that's not, and you don't want to delegitimize his pain. What you can do is pray for your dad, and we'll be glad to pray for him here. And I'm sure that when you, uh, I'm sure you're surrounded by friends and family who say, is there anything we can do? Say, yes, please pray for him. Pray for his healing and pray that his pain be taken away. You could even do some synchronized prayer. A lot of times when people know people who have cancer or other illnesses like that, they really mean it when they say, is there anything I could do? And if you say to them, you know, people are praying every morning at 10 a.m., we'd really appreciate your joining in. People would love to do that. You don't have to be in physical conversation on the personality level with your father to talk to him in your own meditations and your own prayers, to see if you are a Christian, to see Jesus with his hand upon him, to see God with his hand upon him, whatever your religious or spiritual tradition. Your father doesn't have to, with his conscious mind, know that these techniques are being applied. I, uh, I, I, ask you, um, go onto my Facebook page. You know, my public Facebook page, when I've been in, in pain, I was in some great pain this year. It was post-surgery. And there are people on my Facebook page, man, they send the Reiki, they send the energy. I learned from that experience of my post-operative situation and co- uh, conversations on Facebook, how many Americans do live in chronic pain. And There are people praying for each other. There are people doing Reiki. Uh, I'm going to go on there. I'm going to go on there after after we finish this recording and ask uh, for prayers for your father. I don't know his name, but I'll say Ashton's father. And right now, everybody who's listening, please join with me and let's pray for this man. Dear God, we pray for Ashton's father. We know that he is in terrible pain and despair. And we pray to the God of our own understanding that his pain be taken away, that he be healed, that a great spirit pour forth upon this family, that a great love be upon them, lifting them above the despair of this moment, providing a peace that is not of this world. We see him healed. We see him at peace. And so it is. Amen. God bless you, Ashton, and God bless your family. This is from James. Hi, I'm James. I think you might be the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. (laughs) Thank you, James. I seriously went all gaga eye watching your New Year's video. Thank you. All of a sudden, I'm like some school kid who has a crush on his teacher or something. WTF is wrong with me. Yeah, given what age you probably are, I'd have to agree with that. My question is, do you think our government is just fucked? Or do you see a realistic path to get big money out and hire real people with a conscience? Okay, James. In the middle of all the funny and fun stuff, there was a serious question there. And your concern and cynicism is a serious issue. And your cynicism is to some extent legitimate. So this is the deal. 
Do I see a realistic path to get big money out and hire real people with conscience? Absolutely. So this is the deal. It was back in the 80s and the 90s when um, the Supreme Court declared, I think it was earlier than that, actually, the Supreme Court declared that money was free speech. And then a few years ago, the Supreme Court came down with a decision that I think will one day be seen as one of the worst decisions in American history by the Supreme Court, Citizens United. And Citizens United gave corporations unlimited power to use money to affect political campaigns. That began the terrible process uh, that led to where we are right now, which is that our uh, political system is little more than a system of legalized bribery, where clearly we've seen it over and over again, where politicians do more to advocate for short-term profits of corporate sponsors uh, that pour so much money into their to the campaign coffers than they do to advocate for the people. Um, is there a way out? Yes. Now, unfortunately, because of the makeup of the Supreme Court right now, it is not reasonable to think that we will be um, overturning Citizens United anytime soon. If there are any Supreme Court um, openings during Joe Biden's term, Joe Biden, I believe, would be my assumption that he would uh, appoint someone who would be far more likely, certainly, than any of the conservatives on the court today to overturn Citizens United. And that would certainly be the effort that many people will, will make as soon as the, uh, the court does turn uh, in a more liberal direction. However, right now, this leaves us with two issues. One is legislation and one is a constitutional amendment. Now, H.R. 1, H.R. 1 was passed by the House. Uh, H.R. 1 does do an extraordinary, goes to extraordinary lengths. It's fabulous legislation that would end gerrymandering, that would give us automatic voter reg registration, all kinds of things to bolster our democracy. And that's what we need to do. We need to bolster our democracy so that we can overre override the overreach by huge monopolistic corporate forces that are actually destroying uh, American democracy today. There is also the idea of a constitutional amendment. Constitutional amendment is what we ultimately need. We need a constitutional amendment to determine that um, there should be public funding of all federal campaigns. Now that's not easy either because you need the two thirds. I think it's two thirds of the of the court of the of the state houses that agree to that uh, constitutional convention. Most of our state houses are now red rather than blue. They would not want that. You also want to be careful because if we start doing it with that, there are people in this country who would have constitutional conventions. Some of these people, if they could, they'd actually get rid of the Bill of Rights. So this stuff is very, very, you got to really think about what you're doing here. And this is why who's president does matter. Thank you. But people say it doesn't matter who the president is. It sure as hell does because the president appoints the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decides on things like this. So do I think it's a realistic path? Yeah, it's a realistic path. Is it an easy path? No. And is it going to take some time? Probably. But we've got to be in it. If you're in it for your country, you're in it for the long haul. And none of the things, whether it had to do with abolition, whether it had to do with women's suffrage, whether it had to do with civil rights, came quickly or easily. And also, I want to remind you, uh, to, in, in uh, 1907, I think, the Tillman Act uh, under President uh, Theodore Roosevelt, we actually did have an era. It was called the Progressive Era, uh, Republican President um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, a little bit of a different Republican Party at that time. And there was actually legislation. Corporations could not have any influence, financial or otherwise, on our political campaigns. And then that was repealed later. That's, you know, that's how America goes. You know, you two steps forward, one step back. We just got to stay in there. Um, don't lose hope, James. We need you. Okay. Tony. I just wanted to say I'm really enjoying your podcast. I'm a big fan, attended your lectures in New York uh, on the course. After completing my doctorate in 2018, I accepted a new role as the CDAO for a large bank in New Zealand before the pandemic, and I moved to Auckland. I don't have a question, but just wanted to wish you a happy new year and continued success. Not that you need ideas from me for podcasts, but I think a podcast about New Zealand would be interesting as they have a very team 
uh, loving approach to their citizens, a ton the U.S. could learn from. It's not perfect, but definitely has generated a more even distribution of wealth and a practical and fair standard of living for all, having to do with COVID, universal health care, incredible respect for nature, living in harmony with animals and the earth, no employment at will, social safety nets, a greater respect for the elderly and general kindness overall. Well, I would love, we have actually asked, uh, we've actually asked uh, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern if she would be on the podcast, and we were told that uh, she's only doing uh, New Zealand uh, podcasters at this time, but I would love it. So I'm the reason I'm including this is if you're in New Zealand and you have someone who would be particularly good to have on about this, you probably know that in the first presidential debate, when we were all asked who would be our first phone call, I said the prime minister of New Zealand. But my point was that she had said that uh, she wanted New Zealand to be the best place in the world for a child to grow up. And I wanted to say to her, no country is going to be better than the United States as a place for a child to grow up. Now that I'm president, girlfriend, you're on. Came out a little funny, but my point was well taken. And a lot of those people who made fun of me that I recall the prime minister of of New Zealand are now like all gaga over the prime minister of New Zealand. Go figure. A lot's going on. I'm so grateful to you. It's wonderful to have the opportunity to be with you. Uh, Remember, if you have a question for me, write to Marianne at castmedia.com. And uh, if you're enjoying the podcast, please rate and review on iTunes and check us out on YouTube. I want to thank all the wonderful team who makes the podcast possible. Lauren Selsky, Wendy Zoller, Amanda Elliott, Sam Jay, and everybody at Cast Media. All my love to you. This is a very, very serious time in America. And uh, I hope that you too are feeling your most serious, but your most joyful. Much love. See you next time.